The possible link between UFOs and megalithic sites is that both are subjects which are slowly starting to open up now, but were always taboo for the general public to know anything about, as if there was consciously a, a cover-up of this ancient knowledge. Yeah, the past is coming back to teach us that the future can be much more fascinating than what we're predicting it, it will be. Welcome back to Cosmic Consciousness. My name is Jonas, and today it is my absolute honor, my privilege to be here with Brian Forrester, who is an author, a YouTuber, and a leading expert on ancient megalithic sites in South America and around the world. And his research presents some fascinating and extremely compelling evidence for lost ancient civilizations. Brian, I just want to take a moment to appreciate you and your work. Thank you so much for how generously you share the knowledge. It really has made a huge impact in my life. And thank you for taking the time to be here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. So for anyone new to your work, can you share a little bit of some of the most compelling evidence that you see for lost ancient civilizations, for ancient high technology, as, as you call it, and what initially captured your attention about this topic? Yeah, it was the first day that I was in Cusco, Peru, which is the capital of the Inca civilization. And I noticed some incredible megalithic stonework that um, I have a building background. And so I'm, I'm acquainted with working with wood and stone. And so, so when I saw the size of the stones being used and the incredible accuracy of the work, I asked my guide who did this and he said the Inca and I said that's impossible because they were a Bronze Age uh, level society. So that's what started my hands on interest in the subject and uh, that caused me over the course of time to eventually move to Peru in order to continue to pursue this. Peru is really one of the global hotspots of all these megalithic mysteries right and these incredible ancient sites. I think you know, looking back uh, for myself, probably one of the first sites that really like arrested my attention and I was like, whoa, there's something going on here was Sacsayhuaman. Just seeing the, uh, you know, enormous scale of these 200, 300 ton stone blocks that, you know, are fitted in all these irregular shapes and fitted together absolutely perfectly. Can you discuss like your impression of this site and uh, I mean, speculate on how, how this is possible to construct in this way? Well, the interesting thing is when the Spanish first arrived in Cusco, they asked the local people who built that because they were incredibly impressed with it. And they were told uh, it was here when we got here. So the Inca showed up about a thousand years ago from Lake Titicaca um, and built the city of Cusco. So no, nobody honestly knows who did the work. We simply know that it was an ancient civilization that obviously had advanced technology capable of cutting blocks or stones as big as at least 125 tons and being able to move them from the quarry, which is probably three miles away to the present location and interlocking the, the blocks so that they have a, a you know, basically a, almost a perfect fit. Some of them have moved because of earthquake activity, but um, that's, uh, you know, the, the Inca admitted that they didn't do the work, even though archaeologists insist that they did, though they can't explain how it was done. So that's, uh, yeah, that's one of the great mysteries. And per, yeah, Peru is one of the great uh, centers for this incredible megalithic work that we see. Looking at Sacsayhuaman, I mean, it, it, it really does look like they were able to soften these stones somehow. Were these like geopolymers? Did they have some kind of technology for actually softening this stone? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, all the geologists I know who've looked at it say that it's, it's natural stone and they know where the quarry is. Um, to do geopolymer is actually very complicated. You have to grind the stone up to the consistency of, of powdered flour and then be able to mix it. So um, 
So we know where the quarry is, uh, but it, it appears that there was some kind of technology that was able to temporarily turn the stone into almost like a marshmallow consistency. So cut from the quarry, moved, and then set into place where it would reset itself into being a, a solid object, which it is today. Do you have any sense? I mean, can you even guess like what a tool like that would look like to be able to soften stone temporarily? Well, actually, uh, Nassim Harriman, who's, um, what is he? He's a scientist and he um, he's a physicist. And so he actually speculates that they were able to temporarily turn uh, the stone into a form of plasma. That, that's his explanation. And that sounds very, you know, very out of this world, but that was his explanation of, of the only way that it could have been done, that it was temporarily turned into a very, uh, into a softened state and then reconstituted itself once it was placed uh, in the, in the place where it was supposed to be. One thing that I've noticed, you know, and kind of like, I've been following your work for a while now, Brian. And one of the things that I've, I've kind of noticed about a lot of these ancient megalithic sites is that, uh, they seem to be astronomically aligned, right? And that's consistent in Peru and Cusco in, in Egypt. Like the Great Pyramid is the most accurately aligned structure that's ever been built by humans. I mean, this is mind boggling stuff, mm -hmm. but uh, I mean, what does, why do you think that was significant to these ancient builders? What does that, what does that tell us about them or the, the purpose of these structures that they were aligned to the stars? Well, yeah, the, the Great Pyramid is aligned um, almost perfectly to north, south, east, and west. I think it's off by two degrees of arc. Um, and that's, you know, that's common in almost every society is that they, they understood how to align things to north, south, east, and west, uh, taking into account the solstices and equinoxes for ceremonial purposes. Uh, the most interesting thing is that some of these places are actually off by 23 and a half degrees. So Karnak, for example, in Egypt is, is that way, as well as the Ramesseum. And that might suggest that the axis of the earth was different 12 or 13,000 years ago. So that's, that, that's what I find intriguing. Um, and we find that as well in some of the structures in Peru as well, but they're off by about 23 degrees. Do you have any sense why it was so important to have these astronomical alignments? Um, well, some would say it was simply for ceremonial purposes, but um, it's not, you know, it's not that complicated to be able to figure out north, south, east, and west once you look at a yearly cycle, you know, of the, of the earth and the sun and the moon. So um, it is kind of a mystery, though, I will say that. Another another site that is just like absolutely fascinating is is Puma Punku and in, in, in Tiwanaku in Bolivia. Uh, I know you visited this mm -hmm. site many many times, and uh, it just seems so out of place. You know, it's like there there doesn't seem to be the thousands of years of continual gradual progress to get to that site. It's just like boom, there it is. Uh, can you can you discuss uh, that site a little bit and what I mean, just why it's so strange? Well, it's, um, yeah, it's very different as compared to the structures in Peru, which are more polygonal or, you know, multiple sided stones. Everything at Puma Punku and Tiwanaku is almost, almost laser straight, laser flat. And the stone was brought from two different quarries. There's a red sandstone quarry that's about eight miles away to the west. And then uh, the gray andesite stone quarry is about 55 miles to the north. So, you know, the stone, these stones, some, some of the sandstone weighs up to 100 tons, was transported over mountains, you know, to this location. There's no other site on the planet that looks like Puma Punku and Tiwanaku, and they both are the same site. It's mm. just they've been given two different names. And again, standard academics say that the Tiwanaku culture were the ones who built it, and they were barely Bronze Age. Um, and we're talking, you know, with the andesite, it's very hard stone. Uh, we see lots of drill holes and things like that um, that are all consistent with 
like what modern machinery would do. So it's uh, it is it's one of my favorite places and one of the most enigmatic on the you know on the planet. It doesn't match anything else that I've ever seen anywhere. It's, it's all by itself. Um, but again, academia is still trying to say that this relatively primitive culture built it, which is completely impossible. Would you would you guess that this predates uh, the constructions of Sacsayhuaman, Ollanta Tambo, and like other sites in in Peru? Well, I would say it. I, all of these places are likely pre-cataclysmic, so at least thirteen thousand years old. Um, but beyond that, we can't really speculate how far back in time. But we do know there's a a series of cataclysms that happened between twelve thousand eight hundred and eleven thousand seven hundred years ago that would have been absolutely catastrophic to any civilization living on the planet and. Uh, all of these sites we find have been da- like physically damaged by some kind of enormous force. So that again is, uh, is what's mysterious about them as well as um, some of the surfaces are melted, like melted, vitrified. And uh, you know, that's another part of the mystery. Mm, mm. Yeah. I, I mean, these like H blocks, these weird, uh, uh, you know, just these these amazing stone blocks that have been cut in these perfectly flat ways um, are just just mind boggling to see. And I know your research has also found that some of these stones have uh, phenomenal magnetic properties as well. Can you talk about the magnetic anomalies of, of, of some of these stones and what that finding might suggest about this site? Yeah, well, I think it was... Um... It was ancient aliens that that went there and first discovered the magnetic property. They took little um, rare earth magnets and and all of a sudden, boom, only with the gray andesite stone. And so when I saw that, that was Giorgio Zuccolis. um, The next time I went there, then I brought uh, a compass with me and a magnetometer. And the magnetometer just goes with some of the stones, the magnetometer just goes crazy. There's no pattern that I can find, but it's just that, uh, and the compass, the compass in some cases, when you go into the notch in one of the H blocks, it will um, suddenly switch 270 degrees. And then when you pull it back, it goes back to normal again with the, the natural magnetic field. But um, yeah, it's the, the, the gray andesite blocks seem to be magnetized, but not in a, particular pattern like when um when stone has magnetite um in its makeup that is uh, while it's it's cooling the magnetite will actually align together with the magnetic field of the earth hmm. so for this to have different patterns like that is you know it is really inexplicable and probably had something to do with the cutting and transporting process that was involved with the construction of puma pumpu do you imagine that it has anything to do with like the functionality of the site as well, the purpose of the site? Because I know, I mean, this is another pattern that we see at a lot of these ancient sites that the builders are very particular about the types of stone that they're using, right? And where they're placing these different mm-hmm. types of stone. Uh, does that, do those magnetic qualities or, I mean, the use of like specifically andesite in certain places, does that tell you anything about the, the actual function of this site? Yeah, it seems to, because I've been there, I think, about 60 times now. And every time I go, I learn a little bit more about it. And relatively recently, I noticed that it is almost like a, it's a small pyramidal kind of platform shape. The bottom four layers are the red sandstone, which is neutral to magnetism. But the top layer is the andesite, and it goes all the way around as a perimeter. So it's if it was made to set up some kind of magnetic field. Mm-hmm. Um, some say that was for helping uh, seeds to, to grow because it's a very harsh climate, but that could simply be a secondary uh, attribute to it. The original function, I don't know, but it does appear to have had a, a originally a, a magnetic field. So the, the energy inside the structure would be different from outside the structure. Interesting. Interesting. And I mean, it seems too like, I mean, just the tiniest layer has actually been excavated. Uh, what do you think? Do you 
do you would you speculate that there's still a lot more to be discovered underground there at Pumba Punku? Oh yeah, my friend Antonio Portugal went there with a, a number of um, archaeologists, and they did ground penetrating radar, and they found at least one, if not two, large chambers. Hollow chambers exist underneath Puma Punku, but of course the government would not allow them to do any excavation. But then more recently, they flew uh, a quadcopter over it with ground penetrating radar, and maybe even yeah. And uh, they discovered that the site is probably up to 10 times the size of what they originally thought. So a lot of it is obviously underground and they've only excavated down about two and a half feet. And when I've asked them, why don't you dig deeper? They simply say there's nothing there. But of course, they're covering up the reality that um, they, they don't want to know what's there. It doesn't fit their paradigm. So um, Hopefully in the future, there'll be more excavating, but at least, you know, going over and over and over again to a location like that gives you more and more information as to how it doesn't fit in with conventional archaeology or history. Interesting. It's almost frustrating in a way. Like I, I, I feel this same sense at, at the, at the Sphinx in Egypt, you know, it has, it's rumored to have this uh, uh, chamber underneath the front paw uh, you know, these these rumors of a hall of records or something like that. I've heard Dr. Robert Schock speak about that. Uh, what, what is your sense? I mean, is there, do you think that there's a hall of records underneath uh, the Sphinx? Well, actually, it was Robert Schock who, again, he took ground penetrating radar, I think, in the late 1990s. And they did discover that somewhere underneath the area of the front paws, there was a, a hollow area, but again, the government of Egypt wouldn't allow them to do any excavating of it. But um, there's actually a wooden platform in between the front paws. And when I asked our, uh, our local guide expert what that was for, he said, that's the access to the underground area of the Sphinx. The government put it there on purpose so that they could pull it up and be able to go, go down and access the hollow areas of the Sphinx. So we do know the Sphinx does have hollow areas. It's just the government doesn't want to admit that that's the case. Going back and, and forth between Peru and Egypt, uh, some of these ancient megalithic sites, there seem to be some linkages in the sense that, I mean, one of the most famous examples, I think, are these weird stone uh, protrusions or these nubs that we see on a lot of the polygonal masonry in Peru uh, also seem mm -hmm. to appear at sites like the Assyrian temple in Egypt, as well as on uh, Menkare's pyramid. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think that's like uh, a legitimate link? Do you think that there was shared knowledge, shared technology there? Can you comment on some of the uh, connections that you see between those two ancient cultures? I think it was actually different cultures who, who did the work because everything in Egypt is very linear, whereas uh, in Peru, most of it's very organic looking. So it's a left brain approach versus a right brain approach. But yeah, you do find the knobs um, in both locations, as well as in India and I think Greece and other locations like that. So the uh, it's a great mystery as to what the function of the knobs was. Most of the archaeologists in Peru think that they were for assisting uh, lifting the stones up into place. But then when some of the biggest ones don't have any knobs on them, they say, well, the Inca cut those off and polished them and left the other ones there. They never got around to cutting them off, which is completely illogical. So I think they had some kind of an energetic function. Um, and other people have suggested that it's almost like that, that's how this, that the stone was extruded some way and that the knobs were the little nubs left behind. So, I, uh, and some of the ones in Peru are highly polished um, as compared to the other stone surfaces. So it looks like the manipulation of matter uh, in some ways. Mm. Again, possibly making it temporarily soft. It seems like there are some connections, at least some shared knowledge there. Um, because, yeah, the, the mystery of, of these nubs, they are on many sites in India. 
uh, in, in Greece as well. And then there's other things like uh, at the unfinished uh, obelisk in, in Aswan, there's all these strange like scoop marks. Mm -hmm. And in some places in Peru, yeah. there's also like at, at Sacsayhuaman, there also seems to be like similar, not exactly the same, but similar types of scoop marks going on. Can you comment on that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, it's a, it, it seems to be quite similar. The difference is that with the unfinished obelisk, the pattern is very regular. It's like some kind of machine was going along, you know, cause they're all about approximately two feet across. Whereas in, in Peru, it's, uh, it's almost like it was a hand tool that was going in different directions. So similar, similar look, but different technologies involved in the actual work itself. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So Brian, I, I, I'm sure you've been asked this question many times and have sp spent some time thinking about it, but I'm curious to ask nonetheless, like, uh, what happened to all these tools? You know, like this is the mo when I share this idea with friends or, or this is like the most common criticism that I hear is like, mm -hmm. there are no tools that are discovered that have these, you know, highly advanced capabilities. So what happened to all these tools? What are your thoughts on that? Well, the tools were either recycled by different cultures over the course of time, like taken apart, and used for different functions, or they're being hidden in, uh, in warehouses in different countries that the government doesn't want the public to know about, or whoever did the work came, brought the technology, and then took the technology with them somewhere. So I think those are the three plausible possibilities. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I actually think that you know, there is some compelling evidence to kind of believe in this, this uh, ancient alien uh, possibility at the very least at some of these sites. I mean, apart from the fact that there is this massive uh, um, UFO presence that's being in increasingly acknowledged in, in uh, you know, by governments around the world, it's a really interesting time in the sort of history of ufology. Um, but then also, I mean, going back into to like ancient mythologies, like all around the world, right? We find these mythologies of indigenous people who speak of a time when there were sky beings uh, here and present on earth. I think I heard you mention in uh, a video that uh, some Incan people uh, believe that they were descended from uh, beings from the Pleiades, Pleiades or something like that. Is that, is that correct? It's supposedly part of the oral tradition. That's right. And in, in other cultures, too, the Hawaiians talk about that, too, that their ancestors came from the Pleiades. Uh, you know, it's almost a global, the Pleiades are almost a global phenomenon that way. There's also a tribe in um, Indonesia that make their houses almost to look like UFOs. And they say that they're descended from the, you know, it's always talk about the seven sisters who came down. And then the six that went back and one stayed and became the female ancestor of, of the particular group. What are, what are your thoughts on, on UFOs in, in the modern day? Uh, are you, are you following the news? Like some of, some of the stuff that's going on in, in the United States. I mean, there's this UFO report that's coming out in, in June and uh, all this movement in, in the government and department of defense, all these high level officials talking about how, yeah, UFOs are real. Uh, w what's your perspective on all that? Well, I've had a number of sightings myself. So of objects that, or lights or whatever that I couldn't explain. And you get like a hollow feeling in your solar plexus because your, your brain is trying to compartmentalize your, that experience and it, it can't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, other people say, well, did you take pictures? And it's like, you, you can't take your eyes off of what you're looking at. So you don't think about where's my camera. You just, because you don't know how long the experience will last. Right. You just keep looking and looking until the experience ends and then sit down, you know, and start to ponder as to what it was you just experienced. <laughs> where, where, where was that? Can I ask? Um, one was in Hawaii on, on the Island of Maui and, um, all the others have been here on the coast of Peru. 
actually right from, I'm, I'm on the third floor of the house and the ocean is right out that way. And so that's, that's you know, just looking out at night is where I've, I've seen these things that, you know, I, I can't explain what they were hmm. based on conventional science. Hmm. Yeah, it's super interesting. Well, I, I, I mean, I kind of sense that there are some parallels in, uh, you know, the field of ufology, like studying these, these UFOs or UIPs and uh, studying these lost ancient civilizations. I think in some ways, it kind of metaphorically re represents a similar type of opening our minds to a, a, a greater reality. And I do believe that there are some probable connections between these two seemingly disparate topics. Um, my sense is that UFOs or UAP, whatever they are, they've been around earth since before humanity. And, uh, you know, from that perspective, it's not unlikely. In fact, it seems almost probable that they're linked to some of these mysterious ancient sites um, somehow. Um, going back to going back to Egypt, you know, everyone knows about like the, the pyramids and the Sphinx, but so many of these mysteries are, are underground. Uh, oh, yeah. One, one in particular, like the Serapium of Saqqara. Brian, your videos on this, on this site are just amazing. Can you describe to uh, the audience uh, what we find at this site and why it's so exceptional? Yeah, well, it's, uh, as you said, it's, it's, the car, which is one of the largest archaeological sites in the world, most of it is completely off limits to common, you know, normal people. But um, it's a subterranean complex, and uh, you go down a, a staircase and then through a door, and then you walk down this short tunnel, and then there's this very long tunnel that goes on for several hundred feet in the bedrock itself. And as you walk down through the tunnel on the left and right side, you see these niches that are cut into the bedrock containing these giant boxes, some of which weigh 100 tons with the lid being 30 tons, the box being up to 70 tons. The box and the lid are almost always made of one single piece of stone. Um, and it's pitch, you know, without lights, it's pitch black in there. So how these things were maneuvered into the tunnel system is the is the great uh, great question. Um, again, academics say the dynastic people did this, but the stone came from Aswan, which is in southern Egypt. You know, this is in the Giza Plateau area, so transported hundreds of miles. Uh, they say they were the the burial place of ceremonial Apis bulls, but no bones of any bulls have ever been found. Um, I think there are 25 of them, 23 are finished. Two of them were left unfinished and each one is in a different state of completion. Some of them are completely highly polished with hierog hieroglyphics roughly carved into the surface. Other ones are quite, there's one that's unfinished that's in the hallway in the next tunnel uh, next to it, which is just the, the roughened out box itself. The lid is about 50 to 100 feet behind it. And uh, so, you know, it's a very complicated, incredibly enigmatic, mysterious place. Um, it's what we see from being there a number of times is that obviously the boxes were roughed out, probably outside, and then brought into the tunnel and then uh, maneuvered into where the niche is. And then the lid would be put on top of it and then have to be taken off to do the final, you know, the final finish work but they would have been almost hermetically sealed like they're that tightly fitting together that um, you know how that was possible by the dynastic people is impossible so it's one of the one of the most enigmatic places that there is on the planet um, also in the valley of the kings if you visit the big uh, tunnel systems that go through there that go on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet again at the end, you'll always find the remains of one of these giant boxes that look mm. like it exploded or, you know, something mysterious happened to them. Um, and then, yeah, also now you can go under the step pyramid at Saqqara, which before was uh, prohibited because they'd been reconstructing it for like 20 or 30 years. But now you can go down 
a staircase and then into the tunnel system there, which takes you right to the core of the step pyramid. And then you look down this shaft in the bedrock and there's a massive multi-ton box located there as well. So as time goes on, they're opening up more and more of these mysterious sites in Egypt, which is really a welcome thing, you know, whereas in other places they're, they're trying to close these places off, but Egypt is opening these places up, which is actually quite wonderful. I, I remember like one of the first times I saw some of these stone boxes underground, like my mouth literally dropped because it's, it's so, it's such an astonishing sight. The, the, the scale of these boxes that they were moved hundreds of miles finished to such an incredible polish uh, with these precisely flat mm -hmm. walls and angles only to be buried underground um, for, for what purpose, you know, like, I think it's, I think it's safe to say that this wasn't for the burial of, of Apis bulls. Um, what would you speculate are, are, are the, the function or purpose of these boxes? Well, the interesting thing is that you're allowed inside one of them. Um, the one that has the roughly carved hieroglyphics on the surface. And um, if you make the sound, the, the sound of ohm, then the whole box starts to vibrate. It seems to be tuned to that sound. So obviously there's some kind of energetic function with them, whether they were for possibly regen like regeneration, that maybe the builders would go into the boxes at night in order to uh, have their body rebalanced by the energy of the earth vibrating through the box. Uh, that's, that's what I think they were. They obviously weren't made as, as uh, tombs for anybody because they're way bigger than a human being. Uh, you know, the, uh, the conventional way of a burial, like for King Tutankhamun was, you, you know, he was put in a wooden box, which was put in a bigger wooden box and a bigger wooden box. And then, a, you know, then a box that had gold, leaf on the on the outside and stuff like that. So there's no evidence that there was ever anything inside the boxes in the Serapium, unless there was and whatever was in there was taken out and again, hidden somewhere in some warehouse in Egypt or underneath the, the uh, museum in Cairo. Hmm. Hmm. We also find another one of these big stone boxes in, uh, in, in the King's Chamber in, uh, in the Great Pyramid. Is this something different do you think like that box in there served a similar function as whatever these uh serapium uh, uh uh boxes were no it seems to it seems to have the same vibrational function because when you lie down in the great pyramid and again make the ohm sound or somebody sticks their head into the box um and then makes that sound not only does the box vibrate which you can feel, but also the energy is going straight through your body. So again, it seems to be some kind of, re have some kind of regenerative properties. Um, and it, yeah, it, it too, you know, it too was found, da you know, found damaged. So what happened to it, I don't know, but um, that's the, that's the similarity as, as well as the, the obelisks in Egypt too, they also have this, this resonance feeling. There's one that's broken at Karnak. Um, and if you pound your fist on the side of it, it, it rings like a bell. So it, mm. you know, all, all these things were tuned for some reason. Super interesting. Yeah. It definitely seems like at a lot of these, at most of these ancient megalithic sites that vibration acoustics were really important for whatever reason. Can you talk about the effect of or the relation between some of these sites and and consciousness? Um, I ask because I have heard that, for example, you know, in the in the um, people going into the central chamber at uh, the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid um, experience, you know, non ordinary states of consciousness. Do you think there is some relationship there? Yeah. Well, also, what's important is that the whole interior of the king's chamber. Um, is um, is lined in granite, whereas the Queen's Chamber is all uh, limestone. So the Queen's Chamber has a very like dead feeling to it. But if a bunch of people are ch you know chanting or singing or whatever in the King's Chamber, the amplification of the sound is it's almost deafening. 
So obviously there's some kind of a, acoustic resonant um, original function as to why the builders decided to line that chamber with, uh, you know, granite from Aswan as well. Hmm. I've noticed that they're also, I mean, these like mysterious megalithic stone boxes, I've seen a, a number of them in different sites around the world as well. Um, in Japan, there's this like really, there's some really strange megalithic works in Japan, uh, in Turkey, uh, supposedly in Angkor Wat in, in Cambodia, there did used to be a um, megalithic stone box buried underneath the main chamber there. Yeah, I don't know. Do you see a, do you see a connection there? Is that is that evidence again of, of shared knowledge or sh shared technology? Well, it's maybe it's shared, or it's the fact that uh, these different cultures realize the same properties of the same stone. So um, I haven't been to Angkor Wat, but I have been. In, I was in Turkey a couple of years ago, and um, yeah, even in the museum in Istanbul, the Antiquities Museum, they have these massive stone, bo you know, stone boxes that are actually sitting outside and they're made of, uh, uh, I think it's called Royal Porphyry, which is only found at one quarry in Egypt. So the stone was transported from Egypt or taken from Egypt. Hmm. Um, and again, it's a, it's a very hard granitic kind of stone that seems to have this resonance vibratory property and, uh, these boxes also had strange um, scorch, like heat scorch marks to them, as if uh, maybe while they were initially being used, they over energetically overloaded or something and cracked or blew up or something. You know, something, again, that standard ac academia doesn't even look at because they, they don't have an, they don't seem to have an eye or don't want to look at the anomalous properties of this stuff. And of course, can't answer the simple question of how these things were made. Uh, they seem to be dodging these questions on purpose. And that goes in with uh, what we were discussing earlier. The possible link between UFOs and megalithic sites is that both are subjects which are slowly starting to open up now, but were always taboo for the general public to know anything about, as if there was consciously a, a cover up of this ancient knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it's important to physically go to these locations if you can, to be able to you know, see this for yourself. It's one thing to look at someone else's videos, which can be very insightful, but if you're there yourself, then you get to experience this stuff that can't be you know, explained by simple logic. Really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that I so much appreciate the work that you do is that I mean, you explore in a very open-minded way, and yet at the same time, you're also very factually based and grounded in, you know, science and reason, but you're not afraid to ask, you know, real questions and legitimate questions about how, how are these sites possible. Um, just a couple more, more questions for you before we end here. I know you spent, uh, a lot of your work has been around uh, these elongated skulls, the, the Paracas, uh, culture and people and these elongated skulls that are, are found around the world. Can you share some thoughts on mm -hmm. the, the significance of, of that research and what that might tell us uh, about the history of, of, of earth and hu humanity? Do you see these, I mean, were these elongated skull people, the, the, the people who had high technology and were creating some of these megalithic sites or? Well, there are some depictions of that, especially in Egypt. You notice that um, Akhenaten, for example, and especially his children are depicted as having el elongated heads. Um, but the Paracas culture here on the, I, actually I'm in, Par this is where I live. I live in Paracas and uh, I'm actually looking at some elongated skulls right now, but they, um, they morphologically, they're different than a standard human being which is very curious and which is something that, um, again, academics shy away from. So they're completely missing. The suture line that we have going back this way is completely missing in the elongated skulls. And their eye sockets are much larger vertically than normal, at least 50% larger than a normal human being. Uh, the foramen magnum, which is where your spinal column enters the bottom of your skull, is about an inch back from where it should be. 
So that's a that's a genetic difference. Um, and so, yeah, that, it's an ongoing study that I'm doing with them. And genetically, we've been able to study the mitochondrial maternal DNA of 20 of them, and only two of them match Native American DNA. The other ones seem to be linked to the area of Eurasia as if they migrated 3000 years ago from that part of the world, because that's mm. where the other largest elongated skulls in the world are found, especially around Crimea and the Black Sea. So it's, it's an ongoing fascination of mine, uh, completely ignored by uh, standard scholars, but uh, that, that's why I keep doing it because I want to reveal the truth of this stuff to, you know, the, the world in general and not bother with um, having to debate academics who simply ignore the information. Are there any discoveries that you would like to see happen in your lifetime? Well, just more uh, getting more and more people on board to look at this stuff, more, more disciplines looking at it. Um, in general, archaeology is, a, is kind of a closed discipline. You know, they, they try to answer everything without bringing in other disciplines like geologists and stonemasons and um, medical doc. you know, in the case of the elongated skulls, medical doctors and people of that nature. And that, that's what I, I love to do is to expose this stuff, especially in the field to people with, of those different disciplines, because they, none of them can understand what the hell it is they're looking at. They just look, you know, stonemasons look at this sexy woman and just go, that's impossible. You know, even in modern times with helicopters and cranes and power tools, they say that, that, that shouldn't be, you know, that shouldn't be there. And then in Egypt, especially the tunnel systems, which again, we're getting more and more access to as time goes on. Um, we actually get to go inside a, a site called the Osirion this coming October, which has always been off limits, you know, built on purpose underground. There's a big, I was able to be in there in March of last year for about half an hour by myself, just because of local connections. Before that, I would be allowed for like 30 seconds to go down the staircase and come back up. But this guy said, he guided me straight down. I said, can I take video? And he said, sure, go ahead. And, you know, I just filmed away. Uh, it's a video I'm going to re-upload on my YouTube channel very soon. And um, so, yeah, it's all the un underground stuff that was built on purpose underground that intrigues me the most in Egypt. I don't know if I'll discover much more in, in Peru. I don't think there's a megalithic site that um, is waiting for us, you know, hiding, hiding in the jungle or anything, but um, Egypt's very, very incredible. Um, Petra in Jordan and uh, Baalbek in Lebanon are also just mind-blowingly massive sites that can't be, you know, the guides try to explain and you simply have to say, I don't, you know, I, I don't believe you. And um, India is absolutely incredible. I haven't been yet, but there's, you know, this stuff carved into the bedrock in India that just is, is, is mind boggling. And the uh, Kailasa temple is just like one of the oh, yeah. wonders of the world that, yeah, has always captured, captivated my, my fascination. How did, how did they do this? Yeah. And another, another place I wanted to go last March, which, or March of 2020, which we couldn't go to because of the pandemic was Israel. So I'm, that's still on my list because there's, there's an area, there's a tunnel under the Western wall that has at least one block that weighs 550 tons. And it's like, you know, they say, well, King, you know, it must've been Solomon or it must've been King David. You know, it's like, no, you know, obviously Israel as well has, has a uh, hidden history as well, which, um, uh, you know, I wanted to go and experience. Mm -hmm. Hmm. You know, maybe, you know, maybe some, some other locations, but that's, that's on the top of my list because it's relatively accessible. You know, Israel has an incredible history that, you know, that we know of, but, you know, there's obviously stuff there that doesn't fit in even with the, the standard <laughs> biblical history books or whatever. So there's, you know, there's still, a, still a lot of mystery. There's stuff under, under water, which would be great to explore. Um, in the Mediterranean and other locations. So yeah, there's still lots and lots of mystery to 
one we'll spot see. that's recently captured my attention is is Japan. There are these really strange uh, megaliths. Like there's one called uh, Masuda no Iwafune and another called mm -hmm. Ishi no Hoden. These like big rocks that are carved in these really bizarre shapes. Um, and when I mean big, they're like, you know, 800 ton rocks, like massive. And I thought of it because yeah. of underwater structures and there's also this site called uh, the, the Yon Yonaguni Monument just off the coast right. of, of Japan. Uh, have you mm -hmm. been there before? Are you familiar with, with those structures? And what are your thoughts on those? Yeah, I'm very familiar with them. Again, they, they don't fit in with the standard history of Japan, <laughs> just like these other places don't fit in with the standard history. Uh, very enigmatic, um, obviously left over from... Uh, a time where advanced ancient technology existed. Um, in China, of course, there are sort of pyramidal structures, which the government doesn't want anybody to go look at. They're literally planting trees on top of them. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, there's probably also, you know, stuff in, uh, uh, there's stuff in Saudi Arabia, which is very similar looking to, to uh, Petri and Jordan. It looks exactly the same. Uh, made by the so-called Davitians who were, Arabic uh, nomadic people that, you know, again, it doesn't make sense. So uh, Saudi Arabia is open now to the, to the public. So that would be another one that I might go to maybe after a trip to Egypt. I go to Egypt usually once a year. And so I like to go, you know, if you travel that far, it's nice to hop over to another one of these ancient locations since you're more or less in the neighborhood. So, um, uh, yeah, Saudi Arabia is definitely on, on the list of places to go before or after an Egypt trip. Brian, uh, how has studying all these megalithic sites affected your own uh, perspective on life, consciousness, spirituality, metaphysics? Well, it's the simple answer to that is that um, history, the way we've been taught is, uh, you know, very limited to a time frame of maybe 6,000 years, that before that everybody was a hunter-gatherer or lived in very small collections of societies. But obviously what happened was that there was uh, at least one time period, if not more, where you had very advanced civilizations in some way more advanced than what we have, who had the understanding of, of physics um, on a much higher level than what we have and something happened to them, probably through a cataclysmic damage of some kind. And they were, you know, they disappeared. And then these places were reoccupied by cultures that we understand, like the dynastic Egyptians or the Inca, etc. cetera. But uh, that's the, you know, the fun thing is that through interviews like this um, and continuing to make videos, I'm able to get a, uh, my word out to a larger and larger audience. So that there's much more of, a, of an interest, especially from younger generations such as yourself interested in this stuff. Um, and even the younger academics, I think, are starting to look at this and, and question what they've been taught because they can see this stuff doesn't fit in with a standard picture. So um, I'm very hopeful that um, a lot more of this information will will be getting out and that much more will be uh, exposed to, to the world as time goes on. Brian, you've been extremely generous with your time. Just one last question for you. What, what do you envision of, of as the significance of this exploration? How can this knowledge affect or help humanity in the, in the modern era? Well, as we start to discover the, the properties of these ancient things, these ancient structures, it opens a window to be able to uh, rediscover the ancient technologies that were involved in creating them in the first place. And uh, that could be very useful in future generations in terms of being able to understand in, in a much bigger way, the laws of physics um, and how resonance and sound function and things of, of that nature. So, it, yeah, the past is coming back to teach us that the future can be much more fascinating than what we're predicting it, it will be. I personally believe that this represents a massive 
step, like a potential quantum leap in the evolution of humanity as a species, collectively opening our minds to, you know, a, a bigger picture understanding of our place in the cosmos. Brian, thank you so, so very much again for joining me, for all your, your for generously sharing your time. Uh, can you just uh, tell, tell uh, the audience uh, any links to find you and your work at? Sure. Well, my, my website is hiddenincatours.com and 98% of the information there is, is free with links to my YouTube channel and stuff like, you know, articles and interviews and stuff like that. So that's, uh, that's where you can find, uh, and books, et cetera. So that's where you can find out anything you want more or less of me. And I would welcome you if you want to, maybe in six months, contact me again and we can, uh, I'll, I'll share with you what I've learned from my latest trips up in the highlands of Peru and Bolivia and uh, in Egypt again. I would love to. Thank you so very much again. I still have like so many questions for you, but we're going to we're going to leave it at that. You've been such an amazing uh, teacher to me, Brian. Thank you very much once again. And thanks for your time today. And uh, I wish you all the best. OK, thank you very much, Jonas. Until all next right. time. Until next time. Take care. Okay, thank you.